Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Well, tonight, the President of the European Council, Donald Tusk, responded to Theresa May, saying a compromise is still possible. That followed the broadside from Theresa May this afternoon, demanding respect, explanations for why her plan isn't acceptable, or a better idea. Otherwise, it's no deal. No wonder the pound fell. Our political correspondent, Michael Crick, reports. Theresa May woke today to dreadful headlines after the Salzburg summit seemed to leave her Brexit plans in chaos. As she and her aides met to respond, the press gathered in the rain as a camera was summoned to number 10 to broadcast a short speech. She was steadfast, not least on the big problem of Ireland and EU plans post-Brexit for customs checks between Britain and Northern Ireland. It is something I will never agree to. Indeed, in my judgment, it is something no British Prime Minister would ever agree to. If the EU believe I will, they are making a fundamental mistake. Anything which fails to respect the referendum or which effectively divides our country in two would be a bad deal. And I have always said, no deal is better than a bad deal. She never said the word checkers, but defended the cabinet deal struck there in July as the means to frictionless trade in goods with the EU. But in Salzburg, the president of the European Council said checkers won't work. Yesterday, Donald Tusk said our proposals would undermine the single market. He didn't explain how in any detail or make any counter proposal. So we are at an impasse. That admission that Brexit talks had reached an impasse caused the pound to fall again. EU leaders, Theresa May insisted, should now say in detail what was wrong with checkers or do better. Throughout this process, I have treated the EU with nothing but respect. The UK expects the same. A good relationship at the end of this process depends on it. At this late stage in the negotiations, it is not acceptable to simply reject the other side's proposals without a detailed explanation and counter-proposals. And for the first time, she publicly assured the three million plus EU citizens in the UK they'll be able to stay here even if EU states don't do the same for British people. I want to be clear with you that even in the event of no deal, your rights will be protected. You are our friends, our neighbours, our colleagues. We want you to stay. And she repeated... I will not overturn the result of the referendum, nor will I break up my country. We need serious engagement on resolving the two big problems in the negotiations. And we stand ready. After the pasting she got overnight, that was Theresa May fighting back, using very plain and simple language, but angry and defiant in what could prove to be one of the historic speeches of this long, long saga. As the PM left Downing Street shortly afterwards, Labour said the political gains from both the government and the EU need to end. The defiance of the Prime Minister is all very well, but she knows, as well as we do, that the Chequers proposal is not just objected to in Europe, it's objected to back here by her own party. Well, imagine the situation if she tries to take a further step to close the gap. Her own party will then challenge her. Theresa May arrived to start the weekend in her Berkshire constituency, having sent a strong message to the continent. But will it really change anything? 
Well, it's not really clear whether the speech will help the Brexit talks, but there does seem today to have been a more conciliatory tone from European leaders, an effort not to uh, escalate things. Uh, Donald Tusk, uh, in a statement released tonight after the speech, said he remains convinced that a compromise is still possible. I say these words as a close friend of the UK, he said, and a true admirer of Prime Minister May. And Jean-Claude Juncker compared Britain and Europe uh, to being like two loving hedgehogs. Uh, we're not at war with Great Britain, he said, but when two hedgehogs hug, you have to be careful that there are no scratches. The real significance, I think, in this speech is it uh, may, may help preserve Mrs May's leadership uh, for a while. Chequers, of course, doesn't have much support within the Conservative Party, but there were echoes of Margaret Thatcher and no, 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 and uh, so on. And I think Conservatives will admire the way uh, that she stood up to the Europeans, and that should help when it comes to the Conservative Conference in eight days' time. Michael Crick in Downing Street. Well, joining me now from Broxbourne in Hertfordshire is the pro-leave Conservative MP Charles Walker, who also sits on the influential 1922 Committee of Conservative Backbenchers, of course. Um, isn't it a rather empty threat to say it's my deal or no deal when the EU27 know that MPs in the House of Commons will support neither? I think the EU behaved pretty poorly over the past couple of days. I think Donald Tusk's Instagram post of the cakes and the cherry was a particular low point from a man who was a very great Prime Minister of Poland, and I'm sure he regrets doing that now bitterly. Look, the Prime Minister made it perfectly clear we want to have a good relationship with the EU. We're leaving the EU, we're not leaving Europe. I think she made a very a very noble statement about EU citizens and one which most people, almost all people, will welcome. So I think the Prime Minister's in a strong position. And I personally think the EU put itself in a weaker position by its conduct yesterday. There are a lot of citizens in those EU countries who are feeling very, very disconnected from their ruling elites and actually will be rooting for the UK, whether those people want to but remain or leave in their own countries. Why she's in a stronger position? Do you think there is a, a, a majority in Parliament for the Chequers plan, yes or no? The Chequers plan is, is a white paper. The Prime Minister is negotiating off the back of the Chequers plan. I'm sure there will be changes to the Chequers plan. Some colleagues will like, perhaps some colleagues won't yeah. like. But the truth is, we are leaving the EU. We had a democratic vote, and that vote will be respected, as the Prime Minister made clear. But do you we think not MPs will Kingdom. allow a no deal? We're, you know, MPs will not vote through a no uh, deal, I, will they? There is going to be a deal because it is both in the UK's interests and the EU's interests for a deal. Now, these are the negotiations on the way to the deal. There's some hardball, hardball being played. There's some um, harsh words being spoken by both sides. But ultimately, because I believe in politics, because I believe in the power of democratic politics, I believe there will be a deal, and that's what I'm working towards, and that's what the Prime Minister's working towards, and I sincerely hope that's what the EU actually wants and itself is working towards. But this is like religion. I mean, you just believe it's going to happen. I'm, I'm saying to you, where is her threat? If, if they know that even her own MPs won't back her idea and the par Parliament as a whole will not allow a no deal... They can do whatever they want. Because it's in, it's, it's, in, it's in no one's interest for there to be an ugly and rancorous divorce. It's just not in the interests of the EU, Germany, France, two of the largest economies in the world. It's not in the interests of the UK, the fifth largest, sixth largest economy in the world. It is in no one's interest for this to end badly. Because if it does end badly, it actually undermines the legitimacy of the EU in the eyes of many of its citizens. And people need to remember that. This is the big time. This isn't the time of jokes about cherries and cakes. This is really grown-up politics, and we will get a deal. Uh, let me just turn to Justine Greening here in the studio, um, who is the former Education Secretary and, of course, has called for a second... Uh, well, a new referendum on Brexit, a three-way referendum, uh, to, to allow the people to decide. Can we work out, you know, what, what do you think of this today. I mean, you know, there is no majority in Parliament for anything that's on the table at the moment, is there? I don't believe so. Um, that's what I was saying earlier in July. I, I think that's just a reality. It's not something I particularly welcome. Um, I admire the Prime Minister for taking a tough stance, but I think she would be in a better position if she was 
bringing back a deal that we knew would have the support of the British people and Parliament. And I do think we now need to try and find a route through. And from my perspective, I think the responsible thing would be to not just hope that that deal she brings back is one that is a good deal, is to actually find out from the British people whether that's what they think. But how do you think this actually works? I mean, let's assume for a moment that uh, Chequers or something like it doesn't get carried by the House. The House is then facing no, a no-deal Brexit. You believe the House of Commons will stop that, don't you? I can't see a majority for a no-deal Brexit. So does that actually stop no-deal ha you know, happening? Well, I think that's the question, because, of course, uh, the House... House of Commons can table all sorts of motions, but I think in the end, what would be needed is for the government to listen to what MPs were saying in the House of Commons, to respond to any parliamentary motions that went through against a no deal. And I think it comes back in a way to the point that Charles Walker, I think, was alluding to, which is Brexit isn't a moment. This, this is about how we take the next step in Britain's future, but also, to, to some extent, in Europe's future as well. And we've got to remember that all those relationships need to be constructive ones that will allow our countries to be able to work together in the future. So this isn't about winning a particular moment or a particular vote. It's actually about something far more fundamental than that, which is finding a resolution to Brexit that the British people can accept and live with and buy into, with all of the, the challenges that will lay ahead whatever route we take, but also managing to maintain relationships with the EU. And I, I agree with Charles. I think that the, the way in which the European leaders dealt with uh, our Prime Minister was not right. And I think they do need to show respect for the vote that we had two years ago. I think they do need to show respect for the proposals that we're putting on the table. But I would also say that in the end... Which, which the proposals? Because deal... you, you don't respect the proposals on the table at the moment, do you? Do you think My view is, is that the Chequers deal is not workable. But yeah. what I'm saying is that's my personal view. I think we should be listening to the views of the British people. But what are they supposed to respect? You know, what is Europe supposed to respect that it's not currently respecting? Well, I think they need to look at the proposals Theresa May has brought forward. But I also would equally say that we need to finalise the proposals on the Northern Ireland border, which clearly are absolutely crucial, not just for Northern Ireland but for Ireland itself. And these are the thorny issues that now need to be very rapidly worked out. And it does concern me that we're two years down the line from the Brexit vote. There's some fundamental pieces still not in place. And, of course, of course the clock is ticking. And I think... But Theresa May can't bring a second referendum, can she? I mean, she's made it utterly clear that she, she will not do that. She doesn't believe that's respecting the referendum. And, and I... I heard her say that as well. I'm a pragmatist, you know, I did not come into politics to spend all day every day talking about Brexit. The things that I really care about are opportunity, social mobility, um, the economy, housing, all of that. But I think we have to now stop going round in circles. We need to be able to draw a line under Brexit and move on. And what I'm saying is I think there are different ways to do that. A referendum is the route that I think is best likely to do that. But given she won't... The PM doesn't agree. Yeah, well, given she can't agree to a, a referendum because she's said under no circumstances... And if you, if you think Parliament would vote against a no deal, she then has to go, doesn't she? So what happens then to stop Brexit going ahead on March the 29th? Well, I think what will happen is you'll probably see some sort of a, a vote in Parliament against no deal. And, and in a way, the, one of the reasons I was, in, during summer and July, raising all these issues is this is a constitutional crisis for the UK that we need to have a, a route through... And there's no point just saying... But what saying, is the route? That's what I'm saying. Well, is, it, is it a government of national unity? I don't think it's clear to any of us exactly what that route will be or indeed the timelines as to how we would buy some time to, to be able to formulate what the next steps would be. What I do know is that on behalf of the British people, we shouldn't just dismiss this potential route that we're going down and actually ignore some of the consequences of it. And we need to, as a parliament, I think, on behalf of people really get ahead of that curve. And it may be the PM comes back with a deal that Parliament passes. I don't believe that's likely. I don't believe Parliament will support no deal. And I don't want us to simply reach that moment and not have any kind of thinking around how we then, as a Parliament, not just a government, navigate Britain through what is a crucial period. Uh, Justin Greening and Charles Walker, thank you both very much. Thank you. Later, we will be talking to Tony Blair's former head of communications, Alistair Campbell, and now a supporter of the People's Vote campaign.
Well, let's return to our main story. And Theresa May has called on Europe's leaders to respect the UK and warned the Irish border and trade were still major obstacles to a Brexit deal. I'm joined now by Alistair Campbell, Tony Blair's former Director of Communications and now a supporter of a second Brexit referendum. Alistair Campbell, Theresa May has strengthened her position, hasn't she, by standing up to the EU booth? Do you believe that? Well, uh, I'm, I'm believing what <laughs> cabinet ministers are telling me. They think she's Listen, been strengthened. She, she may be trying to be strong, but this has not strengthened her. We, look, we're, we're becoming a national embarrassment, a, a global embarrassment. And I'm afraid that, you know, it's not all down to her, because what I'd say in her, in her defence is that Theresa May, she's not the reason why Brexit's going wrong. Brexit is the reason why Brexit's going wrong. But and I think that yesterday, you know, what happened yesterday is that the lies on which they won and the fantasies on which she's been negotiated, they were confronted with reality. How many times has she been told they're not going to play around with the rules of the single yeah, market? But the EU humiliated her, and that makes your argument for a second referendum much harder, doesn't it? I don't agree. Look, look the thing about Donald Tusk and his stupid picture with his stupid cake, right, it's trivial and it's silly. It was a stupid thing to do, right? But on the substance of this, here's the, there's the Prime Minister. She triggers Article 50 when she didn't need to for her party. She calls an election that she doesn't need to, to get a landslide that she doesn't get, for a mandate she no longer has. She gives a billion quid to the DUP to stay in power. She spends two years with that charlatan Johnson and the incompetent Davis putting together a plan which she never hears them saying, excuse me, this is not going to work. Okay, not so working with your party and not working with so Europe. So given all those things you've set out, if you were her director of comms, what would you have advised her to do? When? Yesterday at Salzburg. When she was confronted with it. Well, I would, I would have advised her not to put herself in a position where the blindingly obvious at some stage was going to happen. Well, it's too late, though. She's got herself in that position. Well, would, How would you have advised sorry, her I, to get out of it? I, I, if I'd have felt I was working with somebody so incompetent in a government so divided, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been there. OK, but... And that, 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 this might this might make sense in your little Westminster bubble, you know, your I'm north, in the Westminster north bubble. Okay, you're in the North London bubble. No, I'm in the, uh, I'm in the national bubble where the country is getting sick to death well, of the mess that these people are creating. Except that Labour pro Brexit voters will actually just think, actually, you know, good on the Prime Minister for standing you know, up for these you know, you but, you, Do you know little... Cabinet Minister Penny Morden's tweet today that EU intransigence is actually increasing support for Brexit. If you got your referendum, you might find that you lose it again. Well, May I dare say, may I say then, shall we put that to the test? I mean, Penny Morden can say what the hell she wants. She's part of this ludicrous cabinet that has spent two and a half years failing to agree a strategy. Oh, it's that, not that's the, also Labour's it's, failed to agree a strategy. Well, I'm not going to pretend that I'm 100% supportive. Frankly, I shouldn't be here because, the, you know, we've got a country that is a government in crisis. We've got a country, the biggest issue, and you can't even get a Labour, a, a Labour front bencher on here. But hasn't you? Jeremy Corbyn actually been rather clever tactically. He's kept all those Brexiteer Labour voters on side by keeping all options open. Honestly, you, you keep giving me these generalised statements about what everybody's thinking. What most people are thinking at the moment is this is a mess. Whatever it was we th thought we were voting for, it wasn't this. The Leavers, most of the Leavers, the Reese Mogs Farages, they hate it because of the, the kind of half in. The half out. People like me hate it because it's just kind of chaos and useless and worst of all worlds. And, and a lot of the people public, just want it over and done with. Yes, but what is it? There has to be an it that becomes a treaty. And it's not the European Union's job to tell her. When she says, mine is the only plan on the table. Sorry, is Macron supposed to sit down? I know what Britain should do to get the best deal out of this. I mean, the whole thing. Look, they won the campaign on lies and they've negotiated on fantasies. And yesterday, the fantasies hit a bit of reality. Now, okay, let, me, let me put a fantasy to you. You fantasise about Tony Blair leading a centrist party. No, I don't. You don't? No. You are, accept he's toxic? What's the, what, what on earth are you suddenly talking about centrist? I'm not interested well, you, you in centrist parties. You mentioned fantasies. I was talking about Yes, well, have your own fantasies. I don't have that one. <laughs> I am not interested. You accept there's no, no prospect of a centrist I am not party. remotely interested. I am interested at a key moment in our history from doing whatever I can, the voice that I have, working with the People's Vote campaign, to try to confront the arguments that have not thus far been confronted about what damage this is going to do to the country. And I think that what happened yesterday was that the country realised, hold on a minute, all the stuff you said was going to be easy is not easy, 
Yes, I thought it was silly that she was humiliated. No need for that. Okay. But Macron absolutely nailed it. He told the truth. They've been, we've been led into this by liars. We're now being governed by okay. fantasies, and it's time that they got real. Alistair Campbell, thanks very much. People's vote. Krish. The Prime Minister has come out of her corner fighting after EU leaders comprehensively rejected her Brexit plan yesterday. In a defiant speech, she's told them it's time to start treating the UK with some respect and that it's not acceptable at this late stage of negotiations for EU leaders to reject her plan with no alternative. The two main stumbling blocks remain, trade and the border with Northern Ireland. The EU Council President, Donald Tusk, has responded this evening, saying that Mrs May has known for weeks and in detail what the EU thinks of her plan, but that a compromise is still possible. Our Deputy Political Editor, John Pienaar, reports. Theresa May's in a hurry, some say getting nowhere fast, landing a Brexit deal. So how to come back from her diplomatic battering, the chorus of EU leaders telling her her Brexit plan wouldn't fly. Her answer in Downing Street, defiance. Their turn to compromise. Britain had rejected the EU's basic demands. Uncontrolled immigration from the EU would continue. And we couldn't do trade deals we want with other countries. That would make a mockery of the referendum we had two years ago. She was Prime Minister of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. On no customs border with Ireland or on the mainland, there'd be no backing down. It is something I will never agree to. Indeed, in my judgment, it is something no British Prime Minister would ever agree to. If the EU believe I will, they are making a fundamental mistake. Mrs May was prepared to walk away from negotiations, though EU citizens settled here would have rights guaranteed. But after the headlines reporting the Prime Minister's rejection and humiliation, she came back with her own final demand. Throughout this process, I have treated the EU with nothing but respect. The UK expects the same. A good relationship at the end of this process depends on it. European leaders lined up against her this week. Now she was keen to show she'd face them down. But there are potential dangers behind her at home. Brexiteer Tories demanding no compromise. They're campaigning to dump the so-called Chequers plan, which leaves the UK tied to some EU rules and standards. It was making it apparent that no deal remains better than a bad deal and that she is not going to give in to the bullying by the European Union, and that's very important. I think, however, it's a mistake to persevere with checkers. That's not really Brexit. The EU doesn't like it because it leaves us too tied into their rules, but without respecting their institutions. And from my point of view, and for Brexiteers' point of view, it isn't properly leaving the European Union. The Irish border and how to avoid border checks after Brexit is still a barrier to a deal. British proposals need more work and more negotiation, the EU Council President Donald Tusk said in a statement tonight. He also called Britain's Brexit position this week surprisingly tough and uncompromising, though he shared the view of Ireland's leader that agreement was still possible. I think we can have a deal. Uh, we're entering into a rocky patch over the next couple of weeks, um, but um, I'm determined to uh, keep working and to secure that, uh, that deal that we need. In Parliament, they say your enemies are behind you. But here, Mrs May's Labour opponents are also preparing to defeat any deal she comes up with. Their wish list, an early election, maybe another referendum. To them, every bad day for Mrs May is an opportunity to make it worse if they can. The Prime Minister's negotiating strategy is collapsing uh, around her. And now the country is staring down the barrel of no deal. Um, the Prime Minister's Chequers proposal was never going to be accepted, either in the EU or by her own party. And so she's in denial. The Prime Minister's back in her Berkshire constituency. It won't count as an escape. She couldn't get away from her troubles over Brexit if she tried. John Pienaar, BBC News, Westminster. Well, we'll talk to John in a moment in Downing Street, but first, our Europe editor, Katia Adler, is in Munich this evening. So, Katia, the president of the EU Council, Donald Tusk, put out a statement this evening in response to what Theresa May has had to say. What did he say? Well, you know, the whole statement came across, Fiona, as partly defiant and... Uh, 
defensive and partly just wanting to be friends again with Theresa May. Look, Donald Tusk is far from the only EU leader to be really taken aback at how the Salzburg summit was interpreted in the UK. They say they absolutely did not go out to ambush the Prime Minister or to humiliate her. But Donald Tusk was the only EU leader to be name-checked by Theresa May in her Brexit statement this afternoon. As the President of the European Council, the representative of all EU countries who public dismissed key parts of her Chequers Brexit proposal as unworkable. Now, he said in his statement he was simply matching strident tone for strident tone. He described Theresa May as surprisingly tough and uncompromising at the Salzburg summit. But it is clear now that both of them misjudged the mood and the political sensitivities of the other. There haven't been any other official reactions from EU leaders to Theresa May's statement this afternoon. They basically see it as directed more at a domestic audience and trying to bolster her political position at home. But EU leaders want a deal. And Donald Tusk said in his statement he still thinks a compromise deal good for both sides is possible. And he signed off as a close friend of the UK and a true admirer of Theresa May. And I couldn't help wondering, Fiona, what her facial expression might have been as she read that this evening. We will never know. Katya in Munich, thank you very much. John Pienaar in Downing Street. The Prime Minister, it, it was a very bruising day yesterday for the Prime Minister. Today she seems determined to show that she's down but not out. What's your assessment of what she was trying to achieve in her speech? Well, uh, Theresa May's defiant tone today clearly was meant to chime with the feeling of Brexiteers in her past. He had a very crucial stage. It was also an assertion of authority and of credibility after a painfully difficult EU summit and the even more difficult headlines that followed that. She does get some credit, some respect for the way that she soldiers on against the odds. But I don't think that ultimately cut, cuts that much ice with the Brexiteers who want her to drop the Brexit compromises that have already cost her two cabinet ministers and could conceivably cost more in future. Now, we're expecting more British proposals on the Irish border now, but they'd have to be something quite unforeseen to successfully break that deadlock. Without upsetting the Democratic Unionist Party MPs, Theresa May relies on for her majority in Parliament. Where does this leave her? In a tight corner with no real political wriggle room, no deal in sight, with time uh, uh, running out and no clear majority in Parliament for any outcome. No one, Fiona, can rule out some kind of agreement in the time that remains. But equally, I think no one can be truly confident of that happening. Listening to Theresa May's defiant, unyielding tone today, the way that that was echoed from Brussels, and knowing, as I think we surely do, that there'll be more of the same from Theresa May when she goes to what will be for her a difficult annual party conference in just over a week's time. John P. and Danny Street, thank you. From checkers to a game of chicken between Britain and the EU. It's been a long old Brexit week and it's not gone so well. It seems rather menacing, doesn't it, somehow? I think that's the idea. It's to put pressure yeah. on the put pressure on contestant. Uh -huh. And what we did here at Checkers is put a plan together that delivers on the vote that people took. It's unblocked the negotiations. <laughs> Hello, Jean-Claude. She's almost at a position now where she's pretty much pickled off everybody. Years of economic pain justified by the exotic present, the exotic present of leaving the European Union. You're not really fulfilling the mandate of the of the people, and you're not really coming out of the of the EU, and that would be a bit of a of a political disaster. This is the sort of Dirty Harry option, isn't it? It's come on punk, make my day. If you make the wrong choice, consequences can be unpleasant. The suggested framework for economic cooperation will not work. I'm not sure why this has come as a surprise to her. If they stick with that position, there will be no deal. There'll be more twists and turns in the Brexit story. It's time for a reset. We are at an impasse. We need serious engagement on resolving the two big problems in the negotiations. We stand ready.
Hello. The week started so well with that big panorama profile of the PM. It ended with fighting talk. Having been well and truly Salzburged yesterday, Theresa May decided to hold her ground today. She stood in Downing Street to explain that if her checkers plan is no good for the Europeans, they now need to come up with a new and better idea. Well, the Prime Minister's statement was designed to so show seriousness of purpose. A lectern was deployed, all probably aimed at Tory party members and Brits more generally, as much as at the EU. Mrs May used the French word impasse to describe the talks. Sounds gentle, but this really could be the worst crisis yet. And despite some conciliatory words this afternoon from Donald Tusk, no one quite knows what happens next. No deal disruption? Or might one of us blink first? Well, as the rhetoric heats up, the pound has been falling. We'll examine the stalemate tonight, and we start with this report from David Grossman. It was the morning of the Salzburg hangover. The EU leader's flat rejection yesterday of Theresa May's checkers plan has caused lots of fizz and a big headache. Back in number 10 and out of the rain, but certainly not home and dry, the Prime Minister delivered her message that the EU wasn't offering anything we could accept. In a statement to an almost empty room, Mrs May said her checkers plan was designed to provide an alternative. The EU just dismissing it, she said, was not good enough. I have treated the EU with nothing but respect. The UK expects the same. A good relationship at the end of this process depends on it. At this late stage in the negotiations, it is not acceptable to simply reject the other side's proposals without a detailed explanation and counter-proposals. As reporters watched from outside, the Prime Minister was doing her best to impress two important audiences. Yes, the rest of the EU, but also her own party. No one wants a good deal more than me, but the EU should be clear. I will not overturn the result of the referendum, nor will I break up my country. We need serious engagement on resolving the two big problems in the negotiations, and we stand ready. Will that defiance win her back any support at her party conference in eight days' time? There she goes. We think back to Chequers, but not back to the drawing board. It's up to the EU, she says, to come up with their proposals. Is that wishful thinking, as some suggest? Someone well plugged into thinking inside the EU says it's actually Britain that will have to move if it wants an agreement. Uh, certainly some senior people on the EU side say that if the British improved the proposals on the governance of the plan for being in the single market for goods, i.e. how to enforce the rules, how to update the rules, how to police the rules and the role of the European Court, if the British moved on those kinds of areas, then at least some EU governments say they are willing to talk about what is in effect membership of the single market and goods, though nobody will call it that. So that's an important part of Chequers, and it may be a little bit less dead than it seems. It sounds as if my voice isn't on track. <coughs> if Theresa May thought last year's Conservative conference speech was uncomfortable, well, if she made further concessions to the EU, this year's could be even worse. I think it could be a very, very rough ride for the Prime Minister when she finally realises how unpopular her Chequers proposals are, not only with the EU, but within the membership of the Conservative Party out in the constituencies. Um, it's, it's a grim time, really. Um, I think it needs decisive action. The Prime Minister can still save the day, uh, but she's going to have to chuck checkers and adopt a more Eurosceptic stance, um, delivering the promises we did make to the British people when they voted to leave the European Union. Labour too want the Prime Minister to abandon checkers, but for an alternative that would even further split the Conservatives. I think in the end, um, whether it's for the economy or whether to answer the question of how you ensure no hard bordering on, in Northern Ireland, there has to be a customs union with the EU and there has to be a strong single market deal. It's the only credible way of delivering on the commitment in Northern Ireland. It's all the, also the only way to safeguard our economy. 
So was this a momentous week in the Brexit story when, as one Eurosceptic put it, checkers went pop? So at one level, nothing's changed. Clearly, we still need agreement on something on Ireland if we're going to conclude the withdrawal agreement. And we need something to go in a political declaration about the future framework of the relationship. That's what we needed before Salzburg. It's what we need after Salzburg. I think clearly what has changed is the tone of the discussions, because you saw from the Prime Minister's statement, clearly she feels she was very badly treated in Salzburg by her fellow leaders. Uh, so she's up the stakes. The Prime Minister didn't return to Chequers this afternoon. Instead, she went to her constituency. But there's no escaping from the trouble that her Chequers plan is in. David Grossman there. We asked to speak to someone from the government. Uh, no one was available today. But here in the studio have Marcus Fish, a Conservative MP and keen Brexiteer. But first, though, let's get an EU perspective. The Italian MEP Roberto Galtieri, who's on the European Parliament's Brexit steering group, uh, he's in Rome. A very good evening to you. Thanks so much for joining us. Look, we're, we're all evening. trying to work out whether Chequers is dead or whether you have, we, should listen, we should listen more carefully to what you're saying about Chequers. Can you tell us exactly what would need to change for Chequers in some form, uh, however close, to, to, be, to, to be salvaged? I, let me quote uh, Theresa May, the Prime Minister, uh, your Prime Minister, who said, uh, neither side should demand the unacceptable to the other. So I think that in Chequers there are a lot of good things, and uh, I think we should build on the concept of a free trade area between the UK and European Union. But there are two elements in particular that I think uh, should be modified, should be negotiated, which are the the, let's say, facilitated custom arrangement uh, and the right. common rulebook. Let me try to make an example. So if you, the UK chooses not to stay in the single market and in the custom union, we can facilitate, simplify all the uh, custom arrangements, but we cannot fully remove them. It's UK, if UK wants to have uh, other free trade agreements and, for instance, let's say, import a chlorinated chicken from the US, they cannot ask us that we cannot any control to avoid that this chlorinated chicken enters right. into our territory. Okay. But so, uh, it's what you're saying, though, is actually quite interesting because it actually says, if, as long as Britain said, look, uh, we're not going to have chlorinated chicken, we will stick by your rules for, the, uh, for goods and agric agricultural products, then we don't need a border. And actually, you're, you're accepting the, the kind of the basic structure of checkers, more or less in the single market for goods, but not for services. No, um, this is another problem. Goods okay. and services are not very simple to disentangle. So there is a component on services in every product. So one thing <coughs> is to remove, uh, to, to, to have zero tariff and to simplify uh, all the regulatory arrangements. One other thing is to fully separate single market for goods from the other part okay. and to allow a differentiated tariff. So in the current checker proposal, which as I say, there are a lot of good things, is not everything unacceptable. There are some aspects which needs to be negotiated and changed because we cannot decentralize the custom controls, outsource them, and right. we cannot have a system with two different tariffs. Tariffs for certain goods and tariffs for other goods because once they enter the single market, it's very difficult to separate them. So there are elements that clearly cannot be accepted, but the point is sit at the table and negotiate seriously. Right. OK, so, so I think it, it sounds like there, are, there is room for negotiation on something approaching checkers. Let me just ask, though, let's suppose the British government takes the view it is at the moment, which is your turn now to come back with your idea, because checkers is the British government's idea and you've said no to it. Um, what, what do we do? Do we just now wait for no deal? Are we playing chicken with each other to see who blinks first? How, how, what happens now? Sorry, I, I'm, I'm not heard fully your, your question, but uh, I think that uh, one, probably one, one mistake in Salzburg was to bring uh, uh, to the level of European Council a kind of negotiation. The negotiation has to happen at the negotiating table. We have a very good chief negotiator, which held, who is Michel Barnier, who has the full backing of the Union. And as was shown in Salzburg, the Union, the union is united behind it. So I think one should a bit de-dramatize and depoliticize this uh, discussion and bring this to a more pragmatic dimension. 
negotiation table and identify the problems and to solve them. We all want a very close relationship, but nobody can ask the European Union to destroy the single market. Right. And no one to actually is asking. Allow no one is asking the European Union to destroy the single market, by the way. Um, look, just wait there, because let me put some of these points to Marcus Fish, uh, Conservative Brexiteer MP. If Theresa May moved and made some more concessions on something around checkers, and it does sound like there's a kind of, there's a little bit of room on the EU mm. side for that to, to be a basis mm. for negotiation. Does that work? Can that work for the Conservative Party and for Parliament? Well, I think that Mr Galtieri made a really interesting point there, actually, when he was talking about the, the, the simplification of the customs processes. I was in Brussels earlier this, this week, and that, that's what I was talking about there with the customs brokers and freight forwarders who were seeing HMRC, seeing the Commission, and that's exactly what they were saying, that, that the Chequers plan is unworkable in that, but, but there are things that you can do to simplify those border processes, which I think is the, the germ of a deal here, because if, if the EU could com compromise on some of that and get that working in Ireland, then I think it would open up well, the uh, compromise on the other the side truth is, from we can the government. Have a, this is all an argument about what our future relationship with the EU is going to be. We can have that argument. The EU will be politely willing for us to fudge anything and accept any of your uh, ideas as long as there's a decent backstop written in for Northern Ireland which says there'll be a border in the Irish Sea rather than on the island of Ireland. And that's the bit, that is the bit that you have no plan for. You're just going well, to tell no, Theresa May to say no, aren't you? Well, no. The uh, Prime Minister is actually very, very right to say that it's unacceptable to have a border right. down, down the Irish right. Sea. Those simplifications, though, they are what can make the Dover-Calais border work without jamming it up. And exactly the same can be can can happen okay. within the island of Ireland, just what? as the EA, ERG laid out last week. Right, but the EU will definitely say you've still got to have the backstop, otherwise they'll be. But that won't should be the backstop. Okay, that is they, the backstop. That won't be their backstop. That's your backstop, not their backstop. Well, that's what that, happens if that is where they need to get to. Right. I think for that's us where, to have a deal. What 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 happens if Theresa May goes to the conference in a, ten days' time and says, "Look, I, I, I'm still backing Checkers." Well. I think she would have the support of, uh, of the vast majority of the country and of the party were she to say that a Canada plus free trade agreement is what we're seeking. And if she continues to, uh, to, uh, to, to be clear about not having a border down the Irish Sea, then that will also have the support of the country. The EU does need to move on that, as I've said. They have laid out the direction in which they might move on that, and we should, we should accept that and go straight for it and get this done. OK, Mr Galtieri. Well, is there any movement uh, yeah, there, well, particularly on the backstop? But we are not actually asking a border in the Irish Sea, not at all. Uh, I, I give you an information that Ireland is already an epidemiolo epidemiologic unit, so we already have checks uh, on live animals, products derived from animals, and those are on 10% on the products. Uh, currently, our proposal is to bring them to 100%, but for instance, we could negotiate a specific arrangement like we have for New Zealand and bring to 45%. Honestly, to bring the control that already exists from 10% to 45%, how can you call it uh, to, to, to build a border in there? That's your a propaganda. What's it's your not plan? True. Sorry, what's your plan for the Irish border if we don't reach a deal, by the way? As I said, we, for us this is a condition. We cannot have a deal without a backstop. Right. So there but isn't for a us, deal. The backstop is not a border. It's a some specific checks right. on live and now, animals and, sorry, uh, and sorry. now asked, and we can uh, organize transit controls which are uh, done online. Like for instance, they exist okay. between the Canary Island and Spain, and sorry. there is no border. Just a quick be one between the Canary Island uh, and you, Spain. You, you so, have said you have said, and the EU is preparing for no deal. You've been sending notices to businesses warning them to prepare for no deal. If there is no deal, what is your plan for the Irish border? How long, how many weeks before you put a border in customs posts? We don't work, uh, we don't uh, for the no deal scenario. We are uh, patiently well, at the table on no deal to negotiate You're sending an agreement notices. because I think that uh, no deal is, is not an option. So we are sure that the rationality will prevail because uh, actually 
the, the distance are not so huge as now are described. We are nobody is asking to put a border in an Irish island. We are just uh, avoid, uh, sticking to what was already agreed in December. Last word to, to avoid the hard border in Ireland and preserve the integral mm -hmm. single market. This can be done in a pragmatic way without putting any border in the Irish Sea. So, so the EU has now accepted the principle that you can have behind the border controls and checks. This doesn't have to happen at the border itself. So you're that agreeing absolutely with it, that you don't up. need a border? No, yes, at all. and you don't need a hard border in the island of Ireland as a result. That's a very interesting um, sort of shared but not shared set of perspectives. Thank you both no, very much indeed. So we have to move on. So sorry, Mr Galtieri. Thank you both It's absolutely very much. not what I said. I right, OK, I thought it might not be. Look, all this is happening nine days ahead of the Conservative Party conference. Not always Theresa May's easiest gig of the year, let's face it. Chequers is a careful attempt to kind of compromise between harder and softer versions of Brexit, but her party is very much on the harder side making compromise all the, uh, all the more difficult. Our political editor, Nick Watt, um, is with me. Nick, as we head to that conference season, what has her statement today done, do you think, for her position? Oh, I think today's statement has definitely brought Theresa May some time as you run into the conference season. It's interesting, Remainers and Leavers were agreed that she put out a good statement and they use similar language about the EU that Donald Tusk, I hear the word impertinence from both sides, that he'd behaved in a very bad way. And that's interesting, tomorrow's Daily Telegraph is reporting that a number of leave ministers are going to use a cabinet meeting on Monday to say to the Prime Minister, maybe check as we should put it out of its misery and let's move towards this, as you were talking about, the Canada Plus idea. Now there are leave ministers who believe that would be a very good idea, but interestingly I was talking to one person, not a million miles away from a leave cabinet minister, who says, actually, do you know what? I think we do need to give the prime minister a bit of space after the way that she was treated in Salzburg. And interestingly saying, give her some time. She's got some proposals coming up on the Irish border. Now is not the time to pounce. But we do know that the European Research Group, we heard from Marcus Fish, Jacob Rees-Mogg, making clear today that they believe that Chequers really doesn't have any life left. And interestingly, one Brexiteer I was talking to described the Prime Minister's performance as a comical alley moment in the bunker. A Brexiteer described A Brexiteer, yeah. yeah. Nick, thank yeah. you very much indeed. Well, which way to turn? Hold firm and risk a more acrimonious split with Brussels or make more concessions? Or is there some kind of third way, a, a way of resetting the talks with some completely different approach? Well, we're going to dissect all of that with journalist and author Paul Mason, Ian Martin from The Times and Stephanie Boltzmann of the German newspaper Diet Welt. And uh, we'll wrap all of that discussion into our daily look at the newspapers and their columns. We'll come to some columns soon, but first, uh, let's take a quick look at the front pages. I'll start with the Daily Mail. She spent months patiently working for a deal with the EU, only to be ambushed and insulted in a stirring riposte. The PM demanded respect for Britain and delivered the May ultimatum. The Times, well, same story, defiant May raises stakes with no deal threat to EU. The Telegraph, as Nick was referring to, their minister's demand, that's ministers, not the EU, the plan B from uh, Theresa May and the Sun May's Brexit fight back up yours furious PM freezes talks with Brussels stirring repost that's how the uh, mail put it what did you make of Theresa May on the steps today Paul there was a dangerous line between looking tough and looking unhinged and remember, you know, when, when, when well, apparently this was 15 seconds on the German evening news, so it wasn't like it sort of was speaking to the German masses. But insofar as it was, I, I wouldn't have chosen that tone because you have to give your negotiating partner some way out. She basically said, there's nothing to talk about, you come up with something. Uh, I do think, my sense is that British conservatism, having been rebuffed with the sort of checkers and a bit deal, um, is moving towards a free trade agreement philosophically because you, you, can, you can only judge whether all the concessions she's made towards the single market in, in, in all but name have worked and they clearly haven't. So if you're in the middle, not in the ERG and not in the hard remainers, you would be thinking, well, that's not working, is it? Right, except for the Irish border. It, it, it. I'm not a Theresa May fan, but uh, I disagree with Paul. I thought she did particularly well today. Quite a contrast with yesterday, and she really needed it. Yesterday was an abject humiliation. And even if you're not a fan of Theresa May, it's easy to sympathise because of the way in which she was treated, particularly by Donald Tusk, 
whose statement this evening, of course, ends with a, I'm a friend of Great Britain. Well, we'll be, a judge of, we'll be the judge of that. And he's an admirer of uh, Prime Minister May. They'll be very pleased, number 10, with those front pages. I think, though, it's important to separate two key elements of this. There is a... Of course, there's, there's part of the Conservative um, tribe and voters out in the country which will be pleased, lots of people will be pleased that she's standing up for herself. But I think it really only buys her time and where she, where she really has a big decision to make is on the substance. And all the signs are that she's going to have to shift. They might allow her to still yeah. use the word checkers, but that she's going to have to move to Canada right. plus. So look, pretty sharpish. Stephanie, help help Britain out here. <laughs> what do we do? Because it does feel like we're now on a showdown. We're just <laughs> facing across the table, waiting to see who blinks first. Is it going to be us, or is it possible the EU will blink first? I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to make a bet here who's going to blink first. But I think looking at these uh, front pages, I think anybody in, in Germany would be really surprised about the tone and that it is becoming so confrontational now. And also, you, you're talking about humiliation uh, in, in Salzburg. Um, there was a way up to that, and it had a little bit to do with my newspaper and with the op-ed that was... she put an article yes, in your in, newspaper. in the bed on, on Wednesday morning, and it... Um, I read it and I thought, wow, this is pretty confrontational now. And why now? Because the briefing people like me got from Brussels and from Berlin was pretty much, calm down, we will Don't help make her. Don't make a fuss now. Don't make a fuss now. There's a party <laughs> conference. Everybody's aware that this is difficult for Theresa May, the so-called Save Theresa campaign. And then this op-ed. And then apparently, according to all the reports, then she read it again at the dinner and they were just... OK, look, just in a word, should Britain go to play it tough and, and risk heading towards no deal and acrimony, or should Britain basically make concessions? Because isn't, isn't that the choice? And I, I mean, too many people have been watching Darkest <laughs> Hour and Churchill going into the subway and the metro and the, the tube and the, the, the public rallying him around and saying, fight it up, you know, don't give in. For, for me, as somebody aligned with Labour, I think that if the Conservatives do bounce off, as it were, the, the Salzburg meeting and go towards a hard Brexit, a free trade, Canada-style deal, the way would then be open for Labour to make a big hegemonic offer to British business to keep us very close. As you heard Keir Starmer say there, in all but name, inside the single market, with the four freedoms, because that's... I, I disagree with you, Ian, here, and with the Conservative MP earlier. I think the mood of business, of just sort of British civil society is help. We do not want to be, you know, sort of empty supermarket shelves on March the 29th. Well, well if, if British business takes a big, what was the phrase, big he hegemonic what? offer <laughs> from John McDonnell, <laughs> Mark's a shadow chancellor, and if it actually Good believes in that, well, well, uh, you know, it, well, we'll see. Um, uh, but would you be tough, playing it tough now, or would you, or would, or, or would you be... Because the, the risk is we're just going to look stupid when we give in in three months' time, isn't I don't it? think it's a question of being tough. I just think you have to be realistic about it. I, I personally thought that uh, Chequers was worth a shot in that the talks were stuck and that it was worth an attempt to try and unlock very difficult talks really doesn't seem to have worked. The difficulty, I think, for Labour is that what Theresa May tried was a sort of botched-together compromise contraption which was effectively aligned with the single market for goods. The EU has ruled that out and said it's essentially Norway or Canada Plus or No Deal. Mm -hmm or remain, of course. Mm. Now, what Labour is proposing, if I can actually understand, if anyone really understands what Labour is proposing, is just a different version of something that's botched together with, bit, with bits of cherry-picking that mm. they like. Now, what Salzburg does is it not only kills Chequers, I think, it kills Labour's um, compromise proposal, and Labour will have to choose as well. Okay. Rarely, I agree with that. OK, <laughs> right. Look, let's, we're going to take a look at some columns tomorrow and some comments and, and Stephanie we're going to start with one of yours this is uh, in, 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 in deep belt this is on the failure of the diplomacy you've been hinting at this um, May's speech at dinner and the article published which she also read at dinner annoyed the 27 heads of government at, the, at, at that dinner is it possible to say we just have not been very good at doing this I mean we're just not very good at it I mean you, you could think that there's a certain track record of cultural misunderstandings between the continent <laughs> and Great Britain that sometimes, I mean, in the last 18 months, the channel has become even wider. But of course, there, there are different theories here. Maybe the Prime Minister played so hardball because she has the 
party conference ahead of her. So we don't really know, but uh, someone said to me today, we will talk about Salzburg for a very long time. And what has happened between Wednesday evening and Thursday afternoon is really that the EU27 are even more united and also united in their anger. Right. But I think a lot of, of, of Conservatives are more united behind Theresa May, aren't they? I mean, isn't that one of the... Well, I and, think and maybe even behind Chequers, because now the Europeans hate it, I think the, uh, the Conservatives can like it. Precisely, and I think Nick Watt earlier in his analysis was right in that people in the Cabinet are trying to give her time and space after her humiliation to shift. I mean, ironically, if she does move in the right way, she probably unites a pretty relieved party, apart from maybe a couple of people who want a, uh, want a people's vote. So it seems pretty obvious that that is the direction in which she's headed in. I think it looks pretty bleak for her if she doesn't move at some point in the next 10 days. If she stands up at Tory party conference and says, Chequers lives, um, I think that would be difficult. problematic. Right. OK, let's just take another column, because Jonathan Friedland uh, in The Guardian tomorrow looks at this whole issue of what he calls, and many people call a people's vote. I don't think pets have ever been asked to vote, so I don't know who else it would ever be. Um, <laughs> he, he basically, he's in favour of a vote. My warning is against seeing it as the magic wand that will wave all our troubles away. People's vote won't be the end of the war. Uh, it'll be the start of the biggest battle of all. I mean, I love this column because it's such a North London column because it's sort of in favor of a people's vote but then it just says oh there's this mysterious land out there that might actually vote leave like it did in uh, 2016. How would people vote? I, 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 I've actually spent quite a bit of time over the summer in that mysterious land, uh, Labour leave land, uh, South Wales, the Midlands and what Labour's activists say is that while they would quite like to have a second referendum after a general election, so Labour to promise it an election, they are worried because, say, in a place like Newport, even with a 9% swing from Leave to, break, to, to Remain, there's still a majority for Leave. Mm. And that's Labour heartland. Um, and, and they do not relish sitting in the pubs and clubs of deep England and Wales having this argument again. But you see, look, my, my contention, Stephanie, pick up on this, is Salzburg pushes people away from Europe rather than towards Europe. The more anger there is and the more blame there is on the Europeans for not being very nice mm. to, to Theresa May, the more likely people say, let's get out of it. We've had sentiment from Tory MPs today, Remainer MPs, saying... Yeah, yeah, um, and I do, I do understand that, but and also about this people's vote, even if, there, if it was then won by Remain, it would only be by a small margin, and then you are actually in the same if it's situation. If it's 52-48, yes. yeah. Well, so those, you're gonna, back in the same situation. We're then right going to do it every four years. It's going to be like the Olympics. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, I mean, well, best of five, maybe even, I would, I would find. Or you might say it's like the referendums are done in Europe. But we did find out that the Europeans actually, under pressure, cohere. I mean, it was a fair bet that they might, under pressure, split apart. You know, Viktor Orban, you know, tipping the wink, I may back you. He said nothing, apparently, in this, in this summit, nothing whatsoever. The so we've learned Euro much harder. The Italian government did nothing. So Much harder than we thought. They'd also spent hours arguing about the problems of migration we'll, in the um, European yeah, Union. Which is what they thought the meeting yeah. was about. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks all very much indeed.